Bird. And I'm the regent of the Silverboat chapter here in Butte, Montana. And we have Joanne Pozzola here with us today. She's a former chapter regent, and she's also a former state regent for the state of Montana. So that's what her sash represents as a former state regent, which is exciting. We also have two members of our chapter here today. We have Eileen Sundberg, thank you for coming, and Diana DeWitt. So we're growing our numbers as we can. Thank you so much for having us here today. So let's dive right in. Let's take a step back in time. After the wounds of the Civil War had begun to heal, patriotism burst back forth in full force, along with a desire to understand the beginnings of our country's independence. The Sons of the American Revolution was founded in New York City in April 1889. Some SAR societies permitted women, and some did not. At their annual general meeting in 1890, they voted to exclude women from membership. <laughs> this galvanized a force of frustrated women who were motivated by the strong desire to express their patriotic feelings and to perpetuate the memory of ancestors who fought to make this country free and independent. The SAR decision sparked controversy and discussion in the national press. In sense that the contributors of women to the American Revolution were not being recognized, Mrs. Lockwood, top right, wrote a fiery editorial in the Washington Post on July 1890, which ended with the question, were there no mothers of the revolution? Her letter became a catalyst for action. William McDonald, vice president of the SAR, disagreeing with the SAR's vote, wrote his own letter to the Post a week later, urging women to organize and offering his assistance. Thus, on October 18, 1890, 18 women and four men met at the Strathmore Arms in Washington, D.C. for the purpose of organizing the Daughters of the American Revolution. This group included the four women pictured here who are considered to be the founders. The society was incorporated by an act of Congress in 1896. Membership in the DAR is open to any woman 18 years or older, regardless of race, religion, or ethnic background, who can prove direct lineal descent from a patriot of the American Revolution. A signature on the Declaration, get the right button here, a military veteran, A civil servant, a signer of an oath, participants in a tea party, prisoners of war or refugees, doctors and nurses, ministers, petitioners, and anyone who gave general material or patriotic support. This is the same criteria for joining the Sons of the American Revolution. So the gentlemen in this group who might be interested in that, that would be the same criteria. The first Continental Congress was held at the Church of Our Father in Northwest Washington, D.C. on February 22, 1892, 131 years ago today. <clears throat> hmm. Continental Congress is the name for the society's annual meeting of its members. The NSDAR is a not-for-profit, non-political, volunteer women's service organization. Today, there are over 190,000 members internationally, 3,000 chapters across 50 states in Washington, D.C. International chapters can be found in Australia, Austria, Bahamas, Bermuda, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Mexico, Spain, and the United Kingdom. The DAR is not a social organization. It is an order patriotic, historical, and genealogical, and holds itself closely to these objects. The objects of the society as laid forth in the first meeting have remained the same since 1890. The society is dedicated to promoting patriotism, preserving American history, and securing America's future through better education for our children. 
Thus, the mission of the society is threefold. Patriotism, historic, and education. This circa 1870 aerial photo shows the, taken from the top of the Washington Monument shows the vast stretches of undeveloped marshy land in the Washington, D.C. area. This unwanted swamp, is that me? This, no, I don't know what you're getting too close to, but I'm sure you'll be fine. The unwanted, Maybe stand closer the to the podium. Yeah, closer. Right into okay. the All right. Yeah. The unwanted swampland is where the visionary founding daughters would build their headquarters. So we have some identifiers. The East Street became Constitution Avenue, Virginia Avenue, Potomac River, future New York Avenue, D Street, C Street, 18th Street. And right off screen over here is where the DAR built their headquarters. They chose this site on 17th Street, one block south of the Corcoran Gallery of Art, which had opened in 1874. And they would become, the D.A.R. building would become one of the choicest pieces of real estate in Washington, D.C. Even today, the government keeps trying to buy that property. <laughs> today, the National D.A.R. headquarters in Washington encompasses an entire downtown city block with 17th, 18th, C, and D streets acting as its boundaries. When it opened in 1907, it was the largest concrete building in the world, opening the Connecticut corridor for major development and underscoring the daughter's wisdom in the selection of their building site. The founding ladies had a vision. They wanted a house beautiful, where they could conduct the business of the society, where daughters could gather, where they could house treasures and artifacts, and where they could store all applications and accompanying documentation. It is comprised of three joint buildings. The first, Memorial Hall, on the right, was built in 1905 and includes the D.A.R. Library, which was founded in 1896 as a collection of genealogical and historical publications for use of staff genealogists verifying application papers for the National Society. Shortly after 1900, the growing collection was open to the public and has remained so ever since. Today, if you're in Washington and you want to do some research, go right on in. The library boasts a huge genealogical research collection that is a premier genealogical library, second only to the Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints Genealogical Library in Salt Lake City. Pardon? Um, also, with Memorial Continental Hall within it, there are more than 30 period rooms with each room displaying a scene from an early American home. The second, pictured on the left, this part, was dedicated April 1929 and is the site of the annual DAR Continental Congress, or membership convention. It is currently the largest concert hall in Washington, D.C. It is nationally recognized as a center for the performing arts. Crowds of nearly 4,000 people can gather here for events like graduations, concerts, gala dinners, and more. The National Symphony in, was founded in the hall in 1930, calling it home for 41 years until moving to the Kennedy Center. The thir third building in the center, the administration building, holds the administrative departments. It's the home of the Americana Collection and the Gallery of the Museum. The D.A.R. Museum was founded in 1890 as a repository for family treasures. Today, this museum holds over 30,000 historical relics, which form a collective memory of decorative and fine art in America from 1700 to 1885. In World War I, the National Council of Defense erected temporary quarters on the land behind Continental Hall. <coughs> In World War II, the daughters dedicated or donated the use of the building to the Red Cross. So now let's segue into Butte, Montana. Seven years after the society was formed, a group of 14 ladies gathered on July 4th, 1897 to begin forming the first chapter in the state of Montana. I love these newspaper articles. <laughs> the library was beautifully decorated with flags and palms in the dining room with flags and red, white, and blue flowers. How many of us do that today? Mm -hmm. December 21, 1897 was considered 
the formal organizing date for the Silverbow chapter. Don't you love this article again? Dainty refreshments were served, the China being over 70 years old. Hmm. Forefathers Day, as mentioned in this article, commemorates the landing of the Pilgrim Fathers in Plymouth, Massachusetts on December 21, 1620. And the idea of Forefathers Day was introduced in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1769. Ten of the organizing ladies were from Butte, two from Bozeman, one from Hamilton, and one from Great Falls. Mrs. Talent, pictured here, was elected as the first Silverbow chapter regent. A regent is the president of, or the head of the organization. In 1902, she was also elected as a state regent. Pictured here is the former home of Jeannie Talent and her husband, Walter. Mr. Walter was a cashier at the Butte Commercial Bank in the early 1900s, and at one point presided over the Butte Republican Club. This home was the site of many DAR meetings, including the society's first meeting on December 17, 1904. In that occasion, that would have been the state meeting, the first state meeting. For that occasion, Mrs. Talent decorated her home in flags, and the national colors with a profusion of flowers. On October, in October 2006, Silverboat Chapter collaborated with the archives in placing this home in the National Register of Historic Places. In addition to its DAR connection, this home also is architecturally significant. Its irregular shape, leaded glass, ornate transoms, and ornamental fence associated with the popular Queen Anne style. All DAR chapters choose a name of a famous person or event dating from the Revolutionary period, but no later than 1825. If, as in the case of Montana, that chapter is located in a state admitted to the Union after 1825, then the name of the territorial historic event, geographic site, or prominent early pioneer can be used. Organizers of the Silverboat chapter selected its name honoring the Silverboat Creek, a stream flowing through the valley just below Butte. In her 1913 History of Montana, Volume 1, Helen Fitzgerald Sanders quotes Captain James S. Miller, an old 1860s Deer Lodge settler, relative to the naming of Silverboat Creek Gulch. Never was a prettier name coined, and it came of this, he said. On the evening of a cloudy day in January 1864, Bud Barker, P. Allison, and Joe and Jim Esther, on a prospecting trip, reached the vicinity of the creek near Butte, and a discussion arose as to its name. As the argument went on, the clouds suddenly rolled away from the sun. Its bright glance fell on the waters, sweeping in a graceful curve around the base of the mountains, burnishing them to brilliancy as they clasped the veil in a bow like silver. Thus originated the name of the creek, the county, and our chapter. A very pretty event in the past week was the dainty pink luncheon given on Wednesday by Mrs. Walter S. Talent in honor of the first anniversary of the chapter. I love how the society pages had their headers. <laughs> This was a typical fashion style for the period, for the ladies. This was a very interesting article. So bear with me. I'm going to read it to you. George Washington's birthday was a big celebration in DR chapters, an annual event. So this article reads, a George Washington reception was given by Mrs. Walter S. Talent, February 22, to 150 of her lady friends. Wow. The hostess was assisted by the Daughters of the American Revolution. The ladies were in colonial costume with powdered hair, paint, and black patches. As the guests entered, they were greeted by the little daughters, Phoebe Webby and Ora Brooke. Phoebe wore a soft pink gown with a kerchief and cap. She carried a spangled fan that was her great-great-great-grandmother's. Ora was in a white costume with national colors. Mrs. Talent wore a Jeffersonian costume of cream crepe with pink and blue flowers. On her arm, she wore an India ring shawl, some 300 years old, two old brooches, and a pair of cream brocade slippers worn at balls given by Washington. Mrs. Barrett was in black. 
black silk, Dutch lace, and wore an old brooch and cap. Mrs. Moore, black silk and point lace pansies and Watteau. Now, I did not know what a Watteau was. I had to do a little research. <laughs> old pin, hair pomodore, and curls. Mrs. Harper brocaded silk with an old polonaise with Watteau and train. Waist was made 100 years ago. Old jewelry, old lace kerchief, hair pomodore, and curls. Mrs. Wethy, brocade costume, with print of hand embroidered on cream satin, very old. Old jewelry, embroidered kerchief of generations ago. Mrs. Kerr, old black silk brocade in yellow, kerchief, cap, and apron. Mrs. Raw, as a Puritan maiden with an embroidered cap. The reception hall and library were in palms and flags. George Washington's picture hung in the library draped in flags painted just a hundred years ago from life. Flags draped the hallways, the dining room draped in continental colors, buff and blue. Floral decorations were yellow tulips. Refreshments were colonial small cake, cider, nuts and raisins, birthday cake, and George Washington's favorite rum punch. <laughs> Bonbons in buff and blue, tapiers lighted the room. The drawing room was in oriental. The wall hung with neutral draperies and the divans Divans filled with oriental cushions and draped with beetle embroideries. Table covered with embroidered coverings. Floor cushion, tire spins, tabaret, or oriental stools and palms were scattered around. The harp and violin discoursed sweet music during the hours, and the reception was one of the most unique and entertaining ever seen in Butte. And this was at her home? This was at her home. 150 people. 150 people in the house you saw. Oh. And Kevin and Joan Shannon owned that house for years. Oh, okay. So I mean, it's amazing. And in this clothing, can you imagine? Hmm. 150 ladies in that oh, house. Yeah, mm. not in that house. I never did find out what a tiger spin was. <laughs> Still researching that one. Hmm. Here's the meeting from April 19th in which they were honoring the battles of Lexington and Concord fought in April 1775. Here's another lovely article about Forefathers Day. An elaborate lunch was served at one o'clock by the hostess, after which came the business meeting and election of officers. No, you know, every reason you could have to have a gathering. So here are some of the ladies that helped form the foundation. Mrs. Topro, Mrs. Harper, was a founding member. Couldn't find information on the middle lady, Mrs. Sly. Mrs. Talent, a founding member, chapter of the state region. The bottom row, Mrs. Reed, state director of the children of the American Revolution. Mrs. Brown, who was the first state regent. Mrs. Turnbill, a founding member, and Mrs. Kern, who was secretary. Now, the Silver Road chapter, along with the Montana Society of Children of the American Revolution, the Meriwether Lewis Society, and the Montana Society, Sons of the American Revolution, were catalysts in introducing the Pledge of Allegiance into all Montana classrooms. So up until this time of the early 1900s, the pledge was not set in classrooms. It was not required. And there was a movement across the country to begin introducing it. I love the title, Teachers Receive Orders. <laughs> well, the principals were told, you can have the pledge, you work it in when you want. It might be at an assembly once a week. And there were particular ways to say the pledge, as you can see, the children have their hands. This time, at one point in time, there was a whole model for how you're supposed to raise your hand to the flag. So it's interesting how that's evolved. Today, in, in Montana, we have 10 chapters. The Butte Silver Road chapter, the first chapter in 1897. Orofino chapter in Helena was organized in 1903. Mount Hyalite in Bozeman was organized in 1912. Chief Enos in Kalispell there we go, was organized in 1917. Shining Mountain in Billings in 1918. Bitterroot in Missoula in 1919. Black Eagle Assiniboine also in 1919 in Great Falls. The Julia Hancock chapter in Lewistown in 1927, and the Milk River chapter in Glasgow in 1956, and our most current chapter, the Quilix chapter in St. Ignatius in 2012. 
Silver Bow chapter draws from that southwest area. So we have members that actually live in Helena and Great Falls, so we overlap a little bit. Today, our chapter is focused. Tradition of celebrating the Constitution was started in 1955 by the Daughters of the American Revolution when they petitioned Congress to set aside September 17th to 23rd annually to be dedicated for the observance of Constitution Week. This resolution was later adopted by U.S. Congress in 1956 and signed by President Eisenhower. Today, in Butte, the Silver Bow Chapter's annual displays at the Butte Silver Bow Archives, the Courthouse, and the Public Library. We encourage the entire community to participate in the Bells Across America program by ringing a bell at 1 o'clock on September 17th honoring the precise time the Constitution was signed in Philadelphia in 1787. In 1921, DAR compiled and published the DAR Manual for Citizenship. DAR distributed this guide to American immigrants at Ellis Island and other ports of entry. To date, more than 10 million manuals have been distributed. Silverboat Daughters assist during the ceremony itself by guiding new citizens to the judge being the first to welcome the new citizens, handing out flags and literature. After the ceremony, we provide a lovely reception with punch and cookies. It's a great opportunity to meet these new citizens and hear their stories. We also hand out children's books on American history and the revolution. <clears throat> a marker was placed by the Silver Bow chapter on August 23, 1931, to mark the location where Placer Gold was first discovered in Silver Bow County. It is referred to as the Pay Gold Marker. A bronze plaque was mounted on a huge six-ton granite holder to mark that spot where Mr. Barker and the others, as previously mentioned, are credited with having panned the first gold along Silver Bow Creek in July of 1864. Years later, the bronze marker was stolen and the boulder sat in disrepair. disrepair. In 2006, a new marker was created from granite and attached to the original boulder in the same site. The marker is located just west of Butte. It's on the left while traveling west along Missler Road near the Silver Bow Creek. And we clean it regularly. In 1907, the Silver Bow Dollars used money they'd raised for a coping to encase a plot of land between Mount Moriah and St. Patrick's Cemeteries that had been set aside for the soldiers that died during the Spanish-American War. The 72 by 56 foot plot was enclosed, enclosed with granite posts and linked with iron chains. In 1908, a stone marker was placed to recognize the soldiers who were buried there. In 1999, a new marker was dedicated as the old marker was poorly faded. In April 2021, Silver Bow Daughters built a podium that included plastic encased, encased pages identifying each of the soldiers buried in the plot along with a biography of each. Through the combined efforts of Mount Moriah and St. Patrick's Cemeteries, the Ancient Order of Hibernians and the Silver Bow Daughters and their husbands, all the graves and headstones were cleaned and or reset, a sprinkler system was installed, and new sod put in place. This past July, we sponsored the Reese Across America Education Mobile Unit at Stoddard Park, and hopefully we'll bring it back again this year. That was quite well received. The Silver Bow chapter has donated four fidget blankets in the fall of 2002 to the Southwest Montana Veterans Home in Butte. We've just received a request for 11 more. Coupons are collected, so if anybody in this room likes to collect coupons, let me know. We are collect them and send them to military families overseas across the globe. The Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marine families can use coupons at base and post commissaries for up to six months past their expire date. From the feedback we received by emails, it is obvious how much these coupons are helping these young families who are living on a limited budget. Additionally, we send needed items to the chaplain's closet at Lange to a medical center in Germany. So typically, those military who've been wounded in battle are sent to Lange Duel and they have nothing but what they arrive with. The DAR offers scholarships and grants. The Helen Pouch classroom grant can be applied for by any Montana classroom teacher, grades K through 12, and they earn up to $500 of a grant awarded each year. 
The DAR offers over 40 scholarships to students pursuing an education in history, economics, law, political science, medicine, nursing, occupational physical therapy, elementary and secondary education, chemistry, math, science, and English. The Silver Bow Chapter is unique in that we sponsor an annual $1,200 scholarship at the University of Montana in Western, University of Montana Western in Dillon. The MSDAR Traveling Scholarship is given the support of a Montana boy or girl in a Montana institution of higher living in the form of an annual scholarship of $500. It's called the Traveling Scholarship because the chapter changes each year that donates or determines who receives that scholarship. Anybody in here, when you were in school, get the DAR Good Citizen Award or hear about it? Oh, okay, great. So we are well known for student essays. The DAR Good Citizen Award is open to all high school seniors in a public or private school. Each school's participating school determines who their school's DAR Good Citizen will be based upon qualities of dependability, service, leadership, and patriotism. <coughs> The winner of each school's award may then choose to enter an essay contest. Students are given a limited amount of time to write on the topic of the essay, and all essays are written without reference or aid. The American History Award. This contest is established to encourage young people to think creatively about our nation's great history and learn about history in its new light. Each year, a unique essay topic is chosen and is open for students grade five through six. The newest scholarship is the Patriots of the American Revolution High School Essay Contest. It focuses on the men and women who figured in the events of the American Revolution, and it's hoped that students will find a patriot to write about who will inspire them. This contest is open to grades 9 through 12. Here we see Margaret and Joanne presenting the American History Contest Award winner with his certificate and medal. Students were totally engaged when they did their little program on the dollar bill. It's fascinating what Joanne does on the dollar bill. <laughs> this year, uh, Rikley School in Glen has four chapter winners and two state winners. State winners go on to compete at the national level. Silver Bow Chapter is working in conjunction with the Adopt the Highway program to help keep our roadsides clean. This past October, we joined about 50 local citizens in the planting of native seedlings. This restoration project will support native species diversification in around reclaimed areas on the Butte Hill. We also love participating in CPR's Dust to Dazzle annual event. That's always a fun day to serve as a docent. Our current two chapter focused projects are the Belmont Mine Model. We all know where that is at the courthouse, and it doesn't work. Well, we're working with some folks to try and get that working again. That's a big goal for ours. And then I don't know how many of you are familiar with the uh, Potter's Field, often re to, referred to as the Riverside Cemetery, Silver Bow's, Silver Bow County's Poor Farm Cemetery, or the Pest House Cemetery up behind NCAT along the highway. So our project right now is to work on who owns the land, identifying as many of the people that are buried there as we can, putting in some markers, and hopefully um, getting a trail to go up that for a walking trail and go that way. So we talked earlier to see, do you have a Revolutionary War veteran? You, Joanne's going to talk to you about how to research on the DAR.org website. You can also visit Ancestry Family Tree and start with what you already know from your family. If you have a family Bible, family stories, pull them out, write them down, and then start digging. And we can help you do that digging. It's our passion. We thank you. You have a brochure. Joanne's going to talk to you in just a sec about how to do that DR website. This gives you a little more information on who we are. And on the back is an email address if you need to reach out to us. And we'd like some help with your family or any other questions. Thank you.
for giving us this opportunity to talk. I'm a, I call myself a self-made genealogist. No formal training, just dig, dig, dig. And one of my problems is I have boxes because mainly my research was done in the 1990s and the early 2000s when you had to go to Salt Lake hmm. or elsewhere, order books. So I have so many copies. <laughs> so that's kind of my research. But DAR Online, I've been a member since 2001. And let me tell you, it took me three years to find a patriot. I was on my father's side. I knew my mother's side had nothing. But on my father's side, somehow or other, I ordered my great-grandmother's death certificate and her parents were on it. And that's all I needed. Then hmm. I went back to the generations and beyond. <laughs> so that got me in. I have a patriot from Virginia, Captain Peter Babb, which we're kind of going to use him. And then I also have a patriot from Pennsylvania that served in the county, not the state, but he served in the county. And I have a patriot from Pennsylvania that gave seven bushels a week to aid the cause. Hmm. So if you gave a horse, and as I have done the research, there are widows that hired somebody to fight or perform in the absence of their husband. Hmm. So you can find a patriot many places. Sometimes they're tough. Hmm. So anyway, how to get on the website. This is the uh, website for the public to get on. Am I going on? Down. Down. There. When you put www.dar.org on, this is the screen you will see. And this is the full screen that you will look at. So it's join. And this is places where if you, for somehow or other, misplace the pamphlet, you can um, go in and um, click on this, and it will take you through the process. And you fill out what you know, send it to Washington, DC, where you live, and they will send that information back to the chapter, and then you can go from there. And if you want some more information, call the archives here and they'll refer you to me. I do volunteer here and they'll get me the information. So, www.dar.org. Today we're going to go into the GRS site. Also, you notice members' site there in that's for the members that belong and they can get in there. Also, the National Society, you can go in and look at pictures of Constitution Hall, the museum, the library, their archives. So there's many things on this site that you can look at. Today, we're going to go into the GRS, which is the Genealogical Research System. Before you even start, Please, please go to the GRS tutorial. It's about a five minute tutorial and it will answer pretty much every question you have. For example, I can't find my ancestor. I researched for a lady from 
Um, she was in Virginia City, her ancestor. Her ancestor's name was Gone, G-O-H-N. Think back. They couldn't read or write. All they could do was pronounce. So whoever was taking the records wrote it down the way it sounded. His Patriot Service was under the name of Coon, C-O-O-N. So there's sometimes less information is better. If you can't find something and you have a very unusual name, try spelling it different ways. Try putting in only the first three. You may get a lot, but if you know the state, that's the one thing that you can try. So on the tabs of that site, it was Ancestor, Member, Descendants, GRC, Revolutionary War, Bibles, Resources. Each one of you can go into each one of these tabs. So the first tab that I went into was the Ancestor, and I put on, I know John Forney lived in Pennsylvania during that time. So I wanted to see if he was um, a member had was a patriot that I could see. Well, guess what? No ancestor record found. So go to, I guess, another ancestor. So the next ancestor, you will see this, and you can put in the ancestor's last name, first name, if you know where they might have had the state of service, state of birth, state of death, spouse, last name, maiden name, or the spouse, first name. I only put in Bab, Virginia, uh, because I knew that I had found his burial, and I knew he was probably served in Virginia, but this isn't always true, because sometimes, like their death can be a different state, because the patriots received land from the government for their service, and it was further west. So you could be in another state. So under BAB, I come up with, in Virginia, these two, and family lore had it that it was Captain BAB. But when I started, I didn't really know. So then I come up with Peter BAB, and it says Captain Peter BAB. You can see each one of their ranks, where their death was, if they had a pension, and where they served under. So if you found an ancestor that served at Bunker Hill, you could see it mm -hmm. here. So then we're going to check out Peter Babb. Let me go back up and show. You want to go in to the, oh, sure, I click her. You want to go into the ancestor number. Each patriot is given an ancestor number as they come in. There was an early application on Peter Babb. I can tell by the, no, they, the original ancestor number would be different than now. When they put the, the information on the computer, the number came up as the alphabet. Mm -hmm. So I can't tell you, but I do know there was early applications. So we went in to go into that. And it's going to bring up all of the ancestors under a child's name. Well, I didn't know my child. Who was Peter Babb's child that I was under? So you can see there's many. So I went back up here. If I knew the member's name, you could go in there. If the member is deceased, his full record lineage will be there. Not his application, but his lineage. If not, they will take off three generations. So I know it couldn't be me or my mother or my father. My grandfather, possibility, because I could have had a cousin's daughter or granddaughter join. And so I am going to go to the um, descendants list, and this is where start doing it here. 
Oh, I keep forgetting to click. Um, so I put in the last name of Jordan. That's my maiden name. And Isaac. Isaac was my grandfather. And when I go in and click on search there, it, I get a hit for Isaac Jordan. That means some other woman put in an application <coughs> under my grandfather on that line. So we're going to go to here where you see the genealogy lineage line. And when I go in there, it's pretty small to see, but it takes me all the way back to my patriot. If you don't find anything under that, and maybe you have two more generations, put in their name. Once again, sometimes if you don't know the information, for example, you don't, I knew where my grandfather was buried, but maybe I don't know where my great-great-grandfather was buried, or grandmother, then don't put in the state they were born, and sometimes you get a thousand hits, but sometimes you can narrow them down. So it's kind of just like you're doing your genealogy, you're looking for a needle in a haystack sometimes. So then I could go in and I could order a, a application for this person. I will tell you, sometimes you're wasting your money because when I, basically, you're gonna get the lineage, but what it is, I will tell you, this is my daughter. She did not have to put any documentation down except her parents. Or her, we just had to send in her birth certificate. So on her application, there was no documentation. So that's why it's good to notify the local chapter and have them look it up because they can see um, the application in and its entirety. Have any questions? I'm going to go and. Can I make a comment? Yes. So when you're doing your yeah. genealogy, what she's talking about with her daughter's case, her daughter didn't have to go back to the beginning ancestor and do the research and documentation. She tied in to existing documentation. Mm -hmm. Some people have to actually go back more generations to get that proof. Right. Her certificates, death certificates, Bible <laughs> records, and, and whatnot. But that, as Joanne said, yep. is something we can help you. We always start here because if we can tie into somebody else, then we don't have to do as much work. Right. <laughs> or you don't have to, yes. Mm -hmm. So if I have my mother's number, her DAR number, mm -hmm. is there a place to enter that? You would put that under the member number. Oh, under, directly under the member. Directly under the member. If not, you could, if you didn't have her number and you knew the ancestor of one of her applications, you could uh, go in to descendants and put a name in and follow it that way. So if I put her number in, then I will get, will I get the direct ladies that she used? I'll what you will get, well, you go into member, the num member, and put the number down. You will get all of the patriots that she, her original patriot, and any other patriot that she turned in as a supplemental. Yes, you would get all of those. And if she is deceased, you would see all of that line, the lineage on each one. But when you're doing this, please don't rule out the women. I tell you that a lot of these go back and forth. Very seldom have I found that where you have a direct line through the paternal line all the way back. Yes, Gloria. So can you use this information to become a member of the Sons of the American Revolution? You can, yes. And you could my son or whoever. Yes, yeah. definitely. You get your application approved, then definitely they can <coughs> go in and do that. Um, we need concrete documentation. Um, if there is a birth and death certificate, marriage, 
They need to be included and usually, probably now it's more generations, but like me, um, my grandfather was born in 1860, so basically <coughs> there wouldn't even be too many generations for me to have certificates for. So you need to find other concrete documentation. Books are good. So, family Bibles. Yeah, family Bibles. And I'm going to go through what we're looking at here. And my little thing is the GRC, which is the Genealogical Records Committee Index. The DAR has had an ongoing project since we went on computer in the early 2000s of transcribing historic documents and putting them on our site. So the GRC here, I went up here and I put in the name Montana and I made this kind of fall, small, Sullivan and the first name John. Does anybody know John Sullivan and <laughs> Silverville <laughs> County? It's a pretty common name. So when I went in, I found 113 hits. <laughs> well, if you have the time, you could go through each one because not all of them may be in Montana or in our county. Disregard if another chapter has sent it in, because I have sent records in. Somehow or other, in my travels, I obtained the birth copies, birth, a doctor's birth record copy from the time he started practicing. So I sent it to Colorado, I sent it to National, and then, so my would be on here, but yet all the information would be Colorado's. So. We're very good about preserving other records. So you can't read it probably, but up at the very first John Sullivan, it says Barclow Family Bible Records, Meyer Family Bible Records, Simon's Family Bible Records, Williams Family Bible Records, Seeley Family, Atchison Family. If any of them, you're researching John Sullivan and any of them, sound familiar, you may want to click on Bibles. And when you go to Bible Records and Transcriptions, I put in Simons and I searched it. And I come up with three. The first one is a Bible description for Charles Henry Bean and wife, Jenny Maria Simons who was married in 1867, Martha Ellen Osgood married in 1881, and each one has the, uh, what it was, and then you can go into the page and see the other names on, the, on that page that have been transcribed. You can't see the actual Bible records, but they have been transcribed into the names. Revolutionary War Records. Patriot Records Project Index contains every readable name of numerous Revolutionary War Records. So you, this is a good one to look for your Revolutionary War. Pension Index. Pension index. Pensions are wonderful. Pension can give you the name of the present wife, the present children if they're under age and he's still supporting them when he got married and, some, and where he lived. Also, in the pension records would be transcriptions from somebody that served in the war with him. It could be a family member. I have one that I researched that it was his brother, and he put in their brother of the, of the uh, patriot applying for the pension. Pension started in 1832 for the Revolutionary War, and also the widows could apply for a pension. And so this is something else that you could research. Patriots of color. This would be 
colored, we have those, we have Spanish-American patriots. We were in the Caribbean during the Revolutionary War, in New Orleans, in that area. So also the forgotten patriots, African-American and African and American Indian patriots. A guide to service sources and studies that you can go into to see if you can find your Revolutionary War patriot. One of my most fun things is to go in to resources. This is help in even your own research. The DAR Magazine Archive, and I have to read this one. The March 1903 magazine stated the following. In the name of the Daughters of the American Revolution of Montana, Mrs. Weed, our Vice State Regent, presented, oh, how do I get rid of that? There you go. <laughs> presented the spade with which the ground for Memorial Continental Hall was broken, or was um, used with the ground breaking. Silverbow chapter, as the only organized chapter in the state at that time, will furnish the handle. A couple other chapters had been and already folded. We had one at Hamilton early and one at Livingston early. A committee of three appointed by the Regent will design the same, the handle. The blade is, as, is of copper from the Montana mines and the handle is of wood cut from the path of the Virginians. Lewis and Clark first explored what is now the state of Montana. The handle is adorned with Montana coal, gold and silver and set with sapphire. The spade is copper, so we have never found out who made the spade, but we're kind of assuming Anaconda did, company did, because Anaconda company provided all the, the plaques for all of the historic markers around the state. So if you're, we don't have any of those plaques here in Butte, the pay gold plaque was stolen probably in the 1980s. Huh. Um, the spade is now in its case in the historical room of Washington, D.C. <coughs> in our national headquarters, and that spade was used for, to break the ground for the rest of the buildings there and anything else around their area that they're working on. Also, what was kind of interesting with the Bay Gold marker, we redid it in 2006, and we had somebody help us with the cement work, I don't know who now, and he got on behind the marker, and he come back out and he said, I can't believe this. He said, my dad worked on that marker in 1931. His dad's name was on there. So it does get to be quite interesting. Silver Bow, chapter has the three markers, and we inherited five active markers with the merging of Beaverhead chapter in Dillon in the 1990s. We have three that cannot be located. Uh, they have been moved or destroyed. We know of one that was at, uh, is it Beaver Mountain, Beaverhead Mountain there? And I can't think, but when the highway went in, they changed the highway and the uh, marker disappeared. Mm -hmm. So, also, if you're interested more in Silver Bow Chapter, this book is here at the archives. You can come up, there's a short three or four pages on our chapter's history. And we think we don't have any connections. <coughs> Am I still on? No. <laughs> Did you break us? Yes. <laughs> I can talk loud. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Uh oh. I'm still not here yet. Is it? Check the phone. There. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. There we go. <laughs> um, we don't think we have any connections to the Revolutionary War in our state, but we do. We have two real daughters buried in the state. 
Um, one was buried about 1910 and the other one in 1925. Their father, who fought in the Revolutionary War, probably had second or third or maybe even fourth marriage and each wife probably got younger to take care of <laughs> the former children. And so we have one buried at Shelby and one buried at Glenda, Sydney, Glenda, Glenda. Those have both been marked. So it's, anyway, that's kind of, any more questions on getting into the uh, website? Just remember, VAR.org will get you in. Okay, thank you so much. Ancestral sheets that were our one, two, three, four generations. If you want to start fiddling around with your family tree and writing down what you think you might know, I'll put them right up here on the corner. If you want one, help yourself. If you want more than one, take more than one. Let me take one to scan and print out. Some it's more. actually from Ancestry.com. Yeah. yeah but this easy. one is really easy to read. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> nice. Yes. So I'll, I'll use your corner right here. Okay. <laughs>